I would like to introduce the last session, of course, uh, uh, because uh, at the beginning we started talking about uh, GCPOA and sanctions, and we have uh, at uh, an opening uh, remark session, uh, His Excellency Dr. Seyed Hossein Sedat Meidani is a member of uh, Iranian nuclear team, and he is based currently in Vienna, working on this very special uh, uh, dossier. And now we have another three remarkable Iranian experts on GCPOA and sanctions uh, uh, regime. So that we like to have this kind of session as the last one in order to conclude the whole hour uh, events today, we have three Iranian uh, remarkable, as I already uh, said, uh, on this issue. Uh, I would like to give the floor currently uh, our uh, my colleague, Julian Maresh, to chair this panel. So the last panel will be only as uh, uh, the thoughts of Iranian side to make up clear what's going on uh, in the next couple of months or what will be the perspective of, of the whole situation on this dossier. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, Mr. Maresh, you have the floor. Thank you, Fabius, for the kind introduction. The last panel is uh, dedicated to one particular topic, the assessment of the economic sanctions on MENAS countries and innovative instruments for training. Uh, the last part is very challenging, I think. I will, um, I will start introducing our distinguished guests, distinguished speakers, and then I will uh, say a couple of words with respect to the topic. First of all, we'll have, we will have here on the floor Professor Fouad Izadi. He's an expert on JCPOA issue from the Tehran University. Professor Mohsen Abdullahi, expert on international and environmental law from Shahid, Shahid Beheshdi University, Iran. Uh, also, Radu Mushatescu, do we have him here with us? Not yet, yes, May, no. maybe a little bit later. Okay, no. okay. okay. Uh, last but not the least, Professor Pouria Askari, also an expert on public international law and investment arbitration from Alamech Tabatare University of Iran. Um, I think in advance to all the, all the speakers, uh, also the, the topic is challenging because we all know the, we are aware of the recent evolutions uh, concerning the J, 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 JPCOA. In short, in brief, uh, the negotiations are expected to resume in order to get the United States to re-enter the deal. And that's the, the challenging um, perspective we, are having, we have uh, ahead of us. Um, from this point of view, many officials across the European capitals are examining how to revive this EU-Iran trade uh, following the lifting of the US secondary sanctions. So uh, our question is, how can the United European Union interact in a beneficial way with Iran, which will lead obviously to a win-win situation and perhaps win-win strategy? Dear, dear, uh, dear speakers, please, you have the floor. I will invite Professor Fouad Izadi. Yes, thank you very much. Thank you for the invitation. And uh, we also need to thank the organizers of the conference. Uh, I have about 10 minutes and I'm going to divide that into three pieces. Uh, first, I'm going to talk about uh, sanctions. Uh, second, I'm going to talk about what the new Raisi administration is doing about sanctions. And the third, uh, I'm going to talk about uh, the ongoing uh, JCPOA talks in Vienna. With regard to sanctions, uh, as you know, uh, they are illegal under international law. Uh, the sanctions that are causing difficulties for Iran are uh, sanctions that are dictated by the US Congress. Uh, and the dictate is that uh, no country, European or non-European, uh, should be engaging uh, with Iran in a serious manner when it comes to international trade. Uh, and they're illegal 
because they violate the very principle of sovereignty uh, in international law. Uh, countries are sovereign. Uh, the United States can dictate to American companies what to do or what not to do, but they are not uh, permitted under international law to impose their congressional laws uh, on other countries. And in the past, we have had in, in the EU uh, blocking statues. Uh, in the 90s, uh, the European countries decided uh, to actually fight back uh, when it came to this type of uh, imposition on their sovereignty. And uh, they basically told their uh, countries, companies, that if you follow what the US is telling you, you're going to pay a cost. Uh, that uh, blocking a statue uh, program was not very successful. One reason was because uh, European companies realized that uh, the punishment from the United States is going to be more painful than the punishment from European countries and their country. That was one problem. And the second problem, uh, I believe, was that uh, some of the European countries at least lost interest in imposing or uh, implementing these blocking statues uh, and they gave waivers a lot and uh, at the end of the day they, they just went away. Uh, so Iran has been under sanctions for the uh, last 40 years, more than 40 years, and uh, the country has learned to live with sanctions. Uh, the sanctions are causing a lot of difficulties for uh, ordinary citizens in Iran, especially the poorer segments of uh, society. But the country has learned to adopt and they are using sanctions uh, to uh, do some good things. For example, uh, becoming independent in uh, uh, areas of uh, science and technology uh, is one result of the sanctions because they cannot uh, go to a European country and buy whatever they need, they need to build it internally. And that requires science, that requires technology, and they have to do that internally. So although the sanctions are causing difficulties for Iran, there are some positive uh, side effects as well. That's the first part of my talk. The second part with regard to the Raisi administration, they uh, basically uh, talked about Mr. Raisi and his people, talked about the fact that uh, they didn't like what Rouhani was doing. And uh, the basic idea was uh, uh, putting all uh, Iran's um, eggs in the basket uh, of uh, the nuclear talks. Uh, they decided, Raisi decided, was not a good idea. And uh, the basic idea was to diversify and not wait uh, for uh, the result of these sanctions. Uh, so they are trying to work more with Iran's neighbors. Uh, the uh, Raisi administration joined the uh, Shanghai uh, Cooperation uh, Organization just a few weeks ago, uh, working more with China, working more with uh, Russia, working more with countries that like to work with Iran is going to be an objective of uh, Mr. Raisi. And in uh, this line of thinking, uh, the Raisi administration uh, is looking forward to bilateral relations with European countries. So they have realized that uh, basically relying on two or three European countries to resolve the difficulties that exist is not a successful idea. Uh, talking to individual European countries is going to be done more in the Raisi administration, as far as I know. And you might have noticed that Mr. Bagheri Kani, who is Iran's deputy foreign minister for politics, uh, visited three European capitals uh, recently, last couple of weeks ago. And uh, it was Germany, it was France, it was uh, UK, and also Spain. Why did he go to Spain? The basic idea was that we, want to move beyond uh, this idea of just waiting for two or three countries and they, they like to do bilateral relations. And I think Romania is going to 
uh, be a country that they like to do to work more with, uh, given the fact that the relations between the two countries have been positive in the last number of decades. So that's what the Raisi government is doing. They are trying to run the government uh, in, in a manner that doesn't depend on oil sales. So if you look at the next year's budget in Iran, uh, they are uh, building uh, an infrastructure that doesn't depend on uh, sanctions being lifted. So the assumption here is that sanctions are going to be there. And this is not a very wrong assumption because as you know, uh, we had the United States saying that Iran wants to build a nuclear weapon. Uh, and then after JCPOA was assigned, they started uh, coming up with other excuses. And uh, in the last number of months, they are talking about Iranian drones, which are generally uh, devices that are defensive in nature. And the countries use drones to monitor their borders and other things. Uh, so, and, and no one in the uh, defense community considers drones to be a weapon of mass destruction. So a lot of people in Iran realize that no matter what Iran does, the United States comes up with uh, another excuse and another excuse to continue the sanctions. And they talk about it. They say that uh, we need leverage. So no matter how much you give in, the conclusion here is that no matter how much you give in, since the United States wants to have leverage, they come up with other excuses to keep uh, the sanctions on Iran as much as uh, they can. And the third part of my talk is going to deal with what's going on in Vienna, as you might have heard, Iran has given uh, two proposals, one on uh, what Iran is going to do with its nuclear program under JCPOA and what Iran expects uh, the other side to do when it comes to lifting of uh, sanctions. And the basic argument that Iran has is that Iran is willing and able to follow the nuclear agreement the way it was before Mr. Trump left. And as you know, Iran stayed within the nuclear agreement uh, about a year after uh, President Trump left the agreement. The idea at that time was that they, they wanted to give the European countries some time to see if, see if they can fix it. And obviously they could not. Uh, so Iran is able to go back to the nuclear agreement. Uh, there's no problem. There's no opposition inside the country when it comes to that issue. But Iran wants to make sure that uh, the same thing that happened before, it doesn't happen again. There's this American saying that if you fooled me once, uh, shame on you. If you fooled me twice, shame on me. And the people in the Raisi administration uh, are not fools. So they don't want to be in a position of repeating uh, some of the mistakes that they consider happened during the Rouhani administration. And, and the basic idea uh, is that the cost of and the risk of dealing with the United States is just too high. Uh, you, you know, in the in US, some of you may know, know uh, there is this uh, credit score that people have. If you have good credit, if you pay your bills on time, you have a high credit score. If you don't pay your bills, if you engage in uh, transactions that you don't follow with, your credit score is low. If the United States government was going to, were going to be graded on a credit score, the credit score of the United States government would be very low because as we speak, we have the people in the US Congress, the Republicans saying that uh, they will destroy whatever Biden decides to do in Vienna. And we have, uh, you know, in the polls in the United States, Trump is actually more popular now than President Trump is. So we don't know what's going to happen in 2024. We don't know what's going to happen in 2022 uh, with the US elections. So there are a lot of difficulties when it comes to dealing with the United States because the US is becoming a banana republic, it seems. And dealing with a banana republic it is going to be difficult for, for Iran or Europe or other parts of the world. And because of that reason, you know, when somebody's credit score is low, they're going to pay a price. And what the Iranian side is saying 
is, is that they need to make sure that doesn't the same thing doesn't happen again. They don't they don't want to go back and forth in the manner that uh, we have experienced in the past. And what the European countries can do is actually follow the logic that Iran is presenting. Um, some of the statements that are coming from E3, uh, UK, France, and Germany is, is not really a positive. The fact that the, the UK foreign minister uh, writes a joint article with the Israeli foreign minister right before the, the talks start is not a positive sign. The Israelis seem to be the military wing of these three European countries. Whatever they cannot get at the negotiating table, they get the Israelis to destroy and kill Iranian scientists. But when you have a, a situation like that, uh, things don't look very good. Uh, the Biden administration says they want to go back to the nuclear agreement. But if they really wanted to go back, they could do it on the first day of Biden's presidency, the same way that he returned to uh, the Paris Accords. He could go back to the uh, nuclear agreement. Nuclear agreement uh, was, uh, the US left the nuclear agreement because of executive order that Trump signed and Biden could just sign another executive order. And the reason they didn't do that is because it seems the US has moved beyond the nuclear agreement. This is not an analysis. This is what people like Wendy Sherman, who is um, the deputy secretary of state uh, is saying that 2021 is not um, 2015. So it seems that the US government has moved away and, and they talk about it if you pay attention. They say that they want to have an agreement that's longer and stronger. By longer, they mean that they want to change uh, some of the articles of the nuclear agreement. As you know, some of the restrictions on Iran is going to finish in eight years or 10 years or 15 years. They want to make those articles go longer. Okay. This is what they mean by wanting to have a longer agreement. And a stronger, they mean they want to get concessions out of Iran beyond the nuclear issue. And as you may remember, the country's leader, Iran's leader, I thought Khamenei uh, during the negotiations mentioned this a uh, couple of times that if the negotiations on the nuclear issue go well, Iran may consider talking about other issues that uh, exist. But we know that the nuclear issue did not go well, the, the Trump administration left it. So it's uh, not very uh, logical for Iran to give more concessions on other issues when the previous concessions have not resulted in much benefit for Iran. And there's going to be a price that the Raisi administration is going to pay internally with internal politics, because it's, it's going to be a political suicide for a politician to just fall for the same rhetoric that existed before. And so the Raisi administration is going to think twice before accepting uh, ideas that uh, have been tested before. So these are uh, some of the difficulties that exist in, in Vienna. I think the Iranian delegation is uh, negotiating in good faith. It is in the interest of the Raisi administration uh, to get sanctions relief. Mr. Raisi has promised different things during the campaign. He does need sanctions relief to be able to deliver on some of these promises. Uh, but they are not going to uh, accept uh, ideas and restrictions and uh, you know things like longer and stronger rhetoric uh, because of the past uh, experience. Uh, I think my uh, time is uh, up. It's raining in Tehran because of the drought. You know, we get happy when we get uh, rain in Tehran. So I'm going to go and take a walk after the conference. It's about uh, eight o'clock p.m. And uh, thank you again for the invitation. I hope that uh, you uh, engage in this type of activities more as we progress. Dear Professor Izadi, please, uh, I would like to keep you for two more minutes and please allow a question. Um, 
Yes. You said yes. that the Iranian economy has uh, accommodated itself with the sanctions and the people uh, have used with the sanctions. Please, uh, I'm interested in understanding if lifting the sanctions would be, is a, is a real stake for Iran. So please, can you tell us what happens actually in, in, in within the Iranian economy uh, if the sanctions are lifted? What will happen? Well, uh, if the sanctions are lifted, uh, Iran is supposed to be able to sell more oil. You know, Iran is selling more than a million barrels of oil as we speak. So the oh. oil sales under the current condition is actually much better than what we had a few months ago. And that's why the Raisi administration uh, believes that they can continue with the current situation. That's why, that's why they are not uh, going to uh, uh, accept uh, unreasonable proposals from the other side, because the country is used to sanctions. The country knows how to go around sanctions. Uh, the country knows that when you give too much concessions, you don't get much out of it. And so the value of JCPOA is not as great as it, as it was before, because Iran has this experience that the Americans promise things. And once they get an agreement, they don't follow through with their promises and they cause difficulties and they're being difficult people. Uh, so uh, obviously, uh, as I said, the Raisi administration likes to get sanctions relief, but it, is that they can manage the country for many years to come in, in, the, in the manner that they're managing. The policy of maximum pressure campaign has failed. Uh, the idea was to overthrow the Iranian government during the Trump administration. That didn't happen. The idea was to have the Iranian economy collapse. That didn't happen. And when you have failed policies, the current administration has this choice in Washington whether to continue the failed policies of the past or realize that they have failed and change course. And it's up to them. And I'm going to stay with you until the end of the session. So don't all be around. Thank you. Thank you for the answer. And, uh, enjoy the rain afterwards. I'll do that. Now I will invite Mr. Professor Mohsen Abdullahi to deliver his speech, his presentation. Thank you. Hello. Do you have Hello. me? Yes. Hello and good evening, ladies and gentlemen, dear old professors, Mr. Chairman. Before starting, I would like to appreciate MEPEI and IPIS for holding and founding this conference. By the topic, implication of economic sanction on the implementation of environmental com commitments, I would like to show you that whether the economic sanctions uh, have negative effects on the international environmental obligations and how such unintended implications of sanctions should be addressed. I will discuss this topic in three following sec uh, sections. First, economic sanctions, one mean and two, uh, one mean and two application. Section two, how sanction undermine the environmental agreements. And finally, the need for environmental exemptions in any sanction regime. Uh, let's start with section one, sanction, economic sanction, one mean and two application. Regardless, of the legitimacy of the sanctions, the economic sanction may be observed from two divergent points of view. First, economic sanction as uh, economic sanctions as a tool against non-cooperative states, and second, economic sanctions as a bar to meet the goals of environmental uh, agreements. I will jump to second point of view. Uh, uh, the economic sanctions can, be, can become key obstacles to meet global climate goals. 
The unintended consequences of the accumulating sanctions can prevent the meeting of the global climate goals, leading to devastating environmental impacts. Most of the environmental agreements set up international financial obligations and mechanisms such as technical and financial assistance, transfer of technology, joint implementation and threat emission, and finally clean development mechanism. It is obvious that the economic sanctions are fundamentally contrary to these obligations, and these obligations have been frequently reiterated in the majority of international agreements. In section two, uh, in section two and next slides, I will try to show you that how sanctions undermine the regime of climate change and international environmental agreements. Uh, economic sanction weaken the implementation of salient international policies and measures by three following ways. Isolation and non-participation in international environmental agreements, leading the targeted countries to unsustainable survivalist policy and production a reduction of the capacity for compliance in targeted countries. First, the international environmental agreements uh, offer a number of principles and mechanisms to build confidence and help to encourage the participation of developing countries in the instruments of environmental protection. The principle like common but differentiated responsibility and mechanisms like clean development mechanism, transfer of technology, and providing technical and financial resources to developing countries. The vast number of parties to Montreal Protocol, UNFCCC, and Kyoto Protocol proves the widespread global support for these mechanisms. However, the participation of the sanctioned targeted countries in the environmental agreements, including Paris Agreement is low. The study of the practice of notion, nations under the UN sanctions shows that these states were anxious about the Paris Agreement, as among the 13 UN sanctioned states, five states have not ratified the Paris Agreement and in their intended nationally determined contribution, INDC, Iran, Sudan, and Somalia mentioned their economic sanction as a bar to attaining the financial sources and the required technologies for successful implementation of their INDCs. Forced to say that Libya as an exception to African states did not disseminate its uh, INDC at all. Among the above mentioned states, the case of Iran is unique. Iran, after six UN Security Council resolution, which imposed a very strict regime of sanction, economic sanction for restricting sensitive part of Iran nuclear activities, uh, agreed joint to JCPOA, so-called nuclear deal, uh, with the five permanent member of UN Security Council plus Germany on July 2015. Simultaneously, Iran submitted its INDC on November 2015 and signed the Paris Agreement on April 2016. Iran's INDC declared its unconditional intention to participate by mitigating, mitigating its greenhouse gas emission into 2030 by 4% compared to business as usual scenario, BAU. In addition to its unconditional mitigation action, Iran, in the light of existence of unjust sanctions, availability of international resource in the form of financial support and technology transfer, exchange of carbon uh, credits, accessibility, accessibility of bilateral and multilateral implementation mechanism, transfer of clean technology, as well as capacity building, the Islamic Republic of Iran has the potential of mitigating additional greenhouse gas emission up to 8% against the VAU scenario. That is to say 12% in total. While the cabinet of the minister and the parliament in Iran had, had approved the Paris Agreement in November 2016, the Guardian Council, which constitutionally holds the veto power Overall legislation approved the majlis, approved by the parliament or majlis, did not ratify agreement. There are two main reasons which may unofficially explain Iran's Guardian Council objection. First, the US withdrawal from the Paris Agreement and GCPOA, 
And second, uh, the reimposition of the UN suspended sanction has put Iran's economy in the worst economic situation it has ever seen. The widespread nature of the sanctions have severely limited the availability of economic sources needed for climate action in Iran. In the aftermath of the renewed sanctions, several companies, including large EU companies, left Iran's market, thereby worsening the economic situation in Iran. Given the situation, there is no guarantee that Iran could comply with its commitments under the Paris Agreement. Economic sanctions against Iran have isolated the country and its ability to meet its obligation under international climate change regime. Second, leading the targeted countries to unsustainable survivalist policy. Economic sanctions generally target daily and economic basic needs of the population, population of the targeted states. In short run, targeted country may resort to, un, to survivalist mechanism to avoid sanction impacts. Iran is an example in this regard again. While, while Iran's daily consumption of gasoline was more than 62 million liters during past UN sanctions time, 2006 to 2013, the US and EU sanctioned the gasoline supply to Iran. As a result, to secure its energy supply, Iran has turned petrochemical factories into oil refineries and produce petrochemical gasoline. In other words, the sanction forced Iran to be creative and to be compromise its environment quality. Iran's home ground petrol contained 10 times the level of contaminants found in, in imported fuel. And the sulfur content of its domestically produced diesel is 800 times higher than that of international standard. And third, reduction of capacity of climate compliance in, in targeted countries. In order to reduce emission, environmental com convention commit their parties to use the best technology or to the consumption of alternative green materials whose production requires the latest knowledge and technology. For the most part, the developing countries do not have access to such technology. Therefore, The, uh, for most part, the developing countries do not, do not have access to such technology. Therefore, their compliance would depend on technology development and or transfer of technology from developed parties of the convention. It is clear that sanctions are a strong bar against any transfer of technology to developing parties of environmental agreements and therefore the, sanction, the, the sanctions decrease the affected developing country from reaching their capacity for compliance. This can ex explain why sanction targeted states parties to Kyoto Protocol have conditioned their vast part of their mitigation action under Paris Agreement to the non-existence of sanctions, availability of international resources in the form of financial support, and effective technology transport. Let's have a look to see the project's story. Economic sanctions uh, have already affected the, the developing targeted states interested in, in Kyoto Protocol's CDM project, Clean Development Mechanism projects. As this figure demonstrates, a number of the registered CDM projects of targeted states have been aborted due to the economic sanctions. Sometimes the figures and numbers are telling without any more explanation. You can see here that Iran have, has had 22 registered CDM project before UN sanction before 2006. And you can see that how just one of these projects could, uh, could get certifi certification from the uh, from the UNFCC Secretariat. And the case is similar for other uh, countries which, which were or are under the UN sanction, that this can explain that how the sanctions, you know, um, deprive these countries from their rights to be benefit from CDM projects 
uh, under the International Convention, I mean that UNFCCC. And the final section, the need for environmental exemption in any sanction regime. A study of environmental situation of the targeted countries has shown that imposition of sanction carries significant unintended consequences for environmental policies of these countries and their capacity for compliance with their environmental obligations. I suggest that the idea of environmental exemptions could protect the world's environmental policies and measures from unintended implications of international sanctions. The exemptions of two, the United Nations Security Council sanctions regime are not unprecedented. Uh, these exemptions are necessary for the effectiveness and legitimacy of the United Nations Security Council resolution. To avoid such these implications of economic sanctions, the UN bodies and all the states are called to consider such implication, implications in the former and any future regime of sanctions. The concept of environmental exemptions may be developed based on two main approaches. Two main approaches. Uh, first, by accepting a new exception to sanction regime similar to humanitarian exemptions. This, this approach is preferred as it could give an independent legal status and more weight to environmental consideration. And second approach is to include the environmental exemption into the consolidated notion of humanitarian exemptions. The relationship between human rights and environmental law, as well as established notion, thus the, this inclusion is have sufficient theoretical foundations. The development of the notion of environmental exemptions, either as a new exemptions or as a part of humanitarian exemptions, may assist in the future development of international law, ex, international law. Extension of such exemptions into the unilateral regime of sanction is necessary for extensive uh, protection of the Earth's environment and its climate system. Thank you for your kind attention. Thank you for your speech and presentation. Um, from the audience, I, I, I have a question to deliver. Namely, uh, the people who are uh, watching us are interested to know your opinion on on uh, the way uh, on the way is regarded among the Iranian policymakers and academics. The real purpose of the nuclear issue is it containing the Iranian regional ambitions? and its influence in countries like Iraq, Syria, or Lebanon, or is otherwise? Please, if you could answer this question for, for the audience. The question is for me? Yes. Actually, yes, I'm not an expert in this area, but it is, I'm sure that the, the Iran has, uh, has inherent right to use and benefit from nuclear, peaceful nuclear technology. And this is why Iran is part of the, uh, the nuclear treaty in, in 1968, uh, non-proliferation treaty. Therefore, you know, if, if you look at all the reports of the IAEA, no, no, no sign you can find that this report says that Iran is developing a nuclear bomb or any, 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 mm -hmm. any, 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 any doubtful activities. Therefore, I think that Iran, like any other country in the world, you know, have rights to benefit from the nuclear technology. And this is, and especially my, my presentation shows that Iran needs to new energy and clean energy. And, 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 and nuclear, you know, energy, and especially electricity from nuclear, uh, nuclear resource is, 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 is Iran need and, and we, should, we, should, we should benefit from this technology as well. Thank you. Uh, thank you for the reply. Perhaps Professor Izadi has a, something on, on this. If not, we can move further, if, how you like. It, 
I can, since, since your time is running out, I, I just uh, add a couple of sentences that, uh, you know, the issue of uh, Iran's nuclear program is started in 2002. Okay. Iran has been under sanctions since 1979. So there's a problem there. So even without uh, Iran's uh, nuclear program, uh, we have the United States and unfortunately some European countries <laughs> that just launch in Iran. And the problem they have is with the nature of the government, it seems. And, and so the Americans were kicked out of Iran in 1979, the dictator that the United States supported was overthrown. And the Americans get upset when the dictators that they support get overthrown. And that's the basic, uh, that, that's the basic problem that exists. If, you know, tomorrow Iran does what Libya did and, and just give up the whole uh, nuclear program altogether, put it in a ship and send it to Virginia in the United States the way uh, Gaddafi did that. Uh, would that resolve problems? No, the other mm. side will find other excuses to sanction. Thank you, thank you. Professor Askari, would you please have the floor? Yes, sure, thank you very much, Mr. Maresh. Good evening, everyone. Um, I'm really happy and privileged to be present in this uh, very interesting conference. I was really enjoying the, the presentations by my colleagues from uh, Iran and also from Romania and abroad. So once again, thank you so much. My presentation today is actually about the US sanctions on Iran and their impacts on the EU-Iran trade relationship. So generally speaking, maybe as an introduction, I have to say Iran and different European countries are traditional trade partners. So we used to have uh, trade relations and uh, the situation for the moment is halted, especially because of the uh, US sanctions. So this is the reason I think it is important in this conference that we are talking about different EU challenges and relationships to talk also about uh, the problem that, that now we have for extending our trade relationship between Iran and also different European states. So to start, maybe if you let me, I want to have a very short introduction on the difference between the United Nations sanctions and the so-called United States sanctions. As mentioned by my colleagues, um, and as you all know it very well, when the JCPOA was in, concluded a couple of years ago, in principle, the United Nations Security Council terminated all its sanctions against Iran. So at the moment that, that now we are talking, Iran is not under any kind of sanctions regime imposed by the international community or the United Nations Security Council. So when we are talking about US sanctions, in principle, we are talking about unilateral coercive measures and not sanctions, which are in principle very different. Because when we are talking about sanctions by the United Nations Security Council, we, we are talking about a kind of, let's say, punishment decided by the international community in accordance with the UN Charter against one of the member states. But when we are talking about UCMs or the unilateral coercive measures, in principle, we are talking about a unilateral act by one of the states who decided to make changes because of its own foreign policy against another state or states. So this is something very important. At the moment, Iran is not under any kind of uh, sanctions imposed by the international community. The second thing that I want to say as an introduction is generally speaking, when we are talking about United States unilateral coercive measures, we are talking about two kinds of different regimes. The first is the ones that, that, that we call as primary sanctions. And those are sanctions which in fact the US is imposing 
on US citizens and US companies who want to have trade relationship or any kind of, let's say, relationship with Iran, which unfortunately also in some areas it is very uh, disappointing, let's say, uh, like academic areas, we can, we can see that now there are uh, heavy pressure and severe pressure by the US administration against US academic centers that they do not have the permission to work with their Iranian counterparts. So these are the primary sanctions, which generally speaking, are the decision of the United States administration to control its own entities to not have any kind of deal or relationship with Iran. But this is not the end of the story. The difficulty is, apart from the primary sanctions, we also have the so-called secondary sanctions, which are the challenging part of the United States sanctions against Iran or any other country under the sanction regimes of the United States. Secondary sanctions are in fact not against the targeted state, not against the American companies or the American citizens, but they are generally against all the partners, trade partners or um, economic partners or investment partners of the targeted country. So in principle, when we are talking about US sanctions against Iran, we do not mean that these sanctions or unilateral coercive measures are merely against Iran, but they are against Iran and all its partners, including all the European countries and all the European companies and all the European citizens who may want to have some trade relationships with Iran. So here we are talking about the kind of dilemma that, 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 that we have in the international legal order and also in generally speaking international relations. There is a hegemon power which is imposing its, uh, its, 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 its power and its sanctions against everyone because it wants to punish one very specific state and in our case study Iran. So if we say that legally speaking that these sanctions are illegal, I would say here at least we can talk about three different reasons. So the first reason when it comes to the unilateral coercive measures by the United States against Iran, the first reason that we can easily say that these are illegal as mentioned by Professor Izadi is because United Nations Security Council in its resolution 2231 under chapter seven clearly obliged all the international community, including the United States, to not interfere in the good implementation of the JCPOA. The resolution 2231 endorsed the JCPOA and asked the international community to do whatever they can to make sure that it is fully implemented. I mean, the JCPOA. So it is very clear that the United Nations excuse me, the United States sanctions are seriously affecting the full implementation of both the JCPOA and the resolution adopted by all the members of the United Nations Security Council. So this is the first very clear reason that, that we can easily say that all of these unilateral coercive measures are illegal. But apart from that, there are at least two other very important legal, legal reasons that, that, that we can use to say that the sanctions are not legitimate. The second one is, as mentioned by the United Nations Special Rapporteur on the negative impact of the, human, of the sanctions or unilateral coercive measures on human rights, the United States imposed sanctions are severely affecting the enjoyment of human rights, including the right to life and the right to health, especially in this very specific time that we are, I mean, we, all of us in this planet are fighting with the coronavirus 
And you can imagine that in a situation like this, we have a very difficult problem because actually the sanctions are there and it is difficult for the Iranian government, but what, what, whatever is the government, it was the Rouhani government or no, the Raisi government, it is very difficult for the, for the Iranian government to fulfill its obligation under uh, different uh, international treaties, international human rights treaties in, 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 in regards to right to health. I mean, to provide medicine and to provide what is necessary to fight against the coronavirus. So when the United Nations uh, High Commissioner for Human Rights is saying that at least in this very specific moment, we have to revise the sanctions. The reason is actually the sanctions are heavily affecting the people and not, and not the, the politicians or let's say the system. And apart from that, we have different principles of international law that the sanctions and especially the secondary sanctions or the secondary extraterritorially applicable regulations of the United States are really affecting. These include the principle of sovereignty as mentioned, and also the principle of non-intervention, which clearly is saying the states as sovereign states have the right, have the inherent right to decide for their own what they want to do in their domestic affairs and also in their foreign affairs. But the secondary sanctions are severely affecting this right of different states, including the European states, when they want to decide about their foreign relationship and about their trade partners. And this is the reason that as mentioned a couple of years ago, the European states finally decided to do something with this because in principle, the US is imposing its own will against all the partners of the target state and in our case, Iran. So the European countries decided to adopt the, the blocking regulations or the blocking statute to do something. This, this means that at least they want to encourage the European companies and the European entities to not comply with the extraterritorial rules and regulations of the United States. But unfortunately, this is not working. And the reason is the fines which are actually foreseen in the European blocking regulations are not comparable at all to the fines and different punishments that the uh, United States uh, Congress has decided to impose on those who are breaking or violating the extraterritorial regulations of the United States. So as a result, it is, it is very interesting. In the latest report of the United Nations Special Rapporteur on the unilateral coercive measures, she mentioned that we see that the European companies are not just complying, but in many cases, what we see is a kind of overcompliance. This means that they are trying to do more to make sure there is no sentence against them by the United States. So this is this is this is this is the situation that we have now, and this is the reason we do not have a good relationship, trade relationship. I mean, between the European different diff, different European states and Iran at the moment. But as we all know, now the talks are going on in Vienna. The JCPOA participants are there. Iran is there, and the U.S., which is not a JCPOA participant at the moment, is also there. And we, we, we don't know what, what, what will happen. There are, there, are, there are lots of challenges. But let's assume that, at least as a presumption, there is a possibility that the, 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 the sanctions are again lifted. And so in general, there is a possibility for the European uh, companies and also for the European different uh, entities to reestablish 
their tr trade relationship and economic partnership with Iran. But the difficulty is actually at this very specific moment, what we are hearing from the Washington and from the US Congress is whatever the Biden administration do, we will reverse it whenever we come back. So when the next President Trump comes, again, we will withdraw from the JCPOA. And this means that the sanctions will be back. So of course, if we just think that how the managers of different European investment uh, companies or trade companies are thinking. They say that, well, okay, maybe this time they, they, they leave the sanctions, but again, it is on a temporal basis and very soon we will have again, the sanctions are back by the next US administration. So here is the difficulty, and this is the last point that, 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 I, that, I, that I want to mention. If the European countries, if the EU really wants to reestablish the relationship with Iran when it comes to trade, investment, and economy, this is the momentum. Now the European states are there. I mean, the E3 are there, and of course the representative, the high representative of the, of the European Union is also there in Vienna negotiating with Iran, with Russia, with China, and also with the United States. And it is very important to use this momentum to find a way to push the current US administration to find a strategy to make sure that the next US administration will not do what, the, what President Trump did, because this is really the key. Without this guarantee, without this, uh, let's say, a kind of assurance, no one can really easily think of reestablishing trade relationship. And, and this is very important. And this is why Iran is really talking about this, that we cannot trust what the Americans are doing. Because at the moment, okay, we know that at least they are saying that we want to lift the sanctions, but we don't know what, what will happen in 2022 and afterwards in 2024 after the US presidential elections. And it is very important. So apart from that, there is also a second point that I think for it, it is very crucial for the European states. And that is to really revise the blocking regulations. As I have mentioned, these regulations are not working. And this is not what, 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 what I am stating. This is what the European uh, authorities also have mentioned. And it is also mentioned in the reports of the United Nations that at the end of the day, when the European companies are forced to take a decision, they go for the punishment by their own government in accordance with the, the blocking statute and the blocking regulations because they are highly weaker than the punishments that they will face if they break and violate the US uh, uh, extraterritorial regulations. So as a conclusion, what I, want, what, what I want to say is if we are talking about an action from the European side, it is not because of Iran. It is, first of all, because of the independence of the European states against this hegemon power, which is using its hegemon currency against all the states. It is now imposing sanctions against Iran, against Venezuela, against Cuba, against many others. And very soon, you will have to take a very important decision, US or China, and that is not easy. So I think this is this is this is the momentum that that I think it is good that we can we can we can talk about about it what the European countries can do to really confront with this let's say threat against their own independence. Thank you very much, Mr. Marish. We thank you, dear Professor Askari. We we could see that your speech came from the from the heart, and also. Implicitly, it provided uh, uh, an answer in full length, at full length to the previous question. We are running out of time. We need to go to the final session of our event.
I will give the floor back to Flavius and to Mr. Mureshan. I thank you all. You had wonderful contributions and we were grateful for having you here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. And um, it was a, a marathon of 10 hours without breaks and so on, but uh, we succeed to come to the top of the discussion about uh, MENA, and, uh, MENA now, MENA history of MENA, MENA now and the, the, the vision. So the concluding uh, uh, discussion, concluding remarks, not concluding, final remarks. I uh, had uh, from the very beginning, uh, I was very pleased together with the flag that uh, uh, General Pivariu have accepted to take part, uh, Minister Severin, uh, also General Branco, if he succeed to, to, to survive also, also other colleagues which want to, to have very short interventions. We are trying to pick up the most uh, interesting and challenging ideas for uh, preparing uh, a, a paper in this respect. So, who wants to take the floor? Uh, General Pivario? I, I have seen you, okay. Okay. Okay, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, distinguished audience, it was a pleasure and a privilege for me to attend this conference and to listen to analysis of internationally and regionally well-known and recognized personality on the issue concerning the Middle East and North Africa. I have a special remark for the excellence presentation of Dr. Adrian Severin. Listening to the honorable speakers, I may draw the following main conclusion. MENA first remain an extremely complex area which will go on playing an important role in the coming geopolitical developments. The off-balance of situation confronting MENA today is also due to the conflict generated by globalization, to the power struggle I'm at resettling the international relation on new basis or resorting on an often used term to the great reset. 10 years after the Arab Spring was triggered, the area is still impaired by the events that were set off and that time had, is impacted by their consequences, not all of them positive and which led either to regional intervention, to counter-revolution and civil war. A certain lessening of the U.S. focus on the area that led to the destabilization and to strengthening the presence of other international stakeholders. Direct negotiation between the parties involved in different conflicts represent a positive factor and even whatever they may or may not reach results, they must be continued. Saudi Arabia and the Gulf country continue to have an ever important role in finding a stability solution in the Middle East. The normalization of the tie with Israel go forward, taking timid steps, and is still far from coming to an end, and so is the case with the Palestinian problem. Iran continues to lead the so-called axis of resistance, which include numerous non-state actors from the Lebanese Hezbollah to Houthi rebels and Assad Syria. Iran is an unavoidable player. Starting with 2015, Russia strengthened its presence and influence in the area, taking advantage not only of the U.S. decision not necessarily getting involved in Syria, but also of the rivalry among Iran, Saudi Arabia, and Turkey. Nevertheless, Russia did not get a greater influence on other conflict in the Middle East, such as the Yemen one, or the Israeli-Palestinian one. Yet Russia improved its relation with the Gulf country and Israel. China constantly improved its position in the Middle East and will probably choose to be a more visible presence in the solving the regional conflicts. Under President Recep Tayyip Erdogan lead, Turkey became during the last decade an even important force on the international arena, including in military terms. Its position may be weakened by the economic difficulty it is confronted with. 
A mediation aimed at stability and development in MENA is necessary and may be possible. The form of such a mediation should be agreed upon by all parties involved and interested. I suggest that the papers presented and published to be published in a separate volume or included in the next issue of MEPE magazine. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you so much, and uh, thank you so much, uh, uh, Professor Adrian Severin, uh, coming back from, from the classes uh, to, to join our final discussion. And also, I, uh, I invite also other colleagues uh, which express their interest to have also some contribution uh, for the final remarks. Professor Adrian Severin has the floor. Well, thank you very much. Uh, I think that Mr. Pivario made a very good sum up of these uh, talks, of these uh, of these contributions of today, of the debates of today. I wouldn't dare to uh, to try the same exercise. I must uh, say that uh, I covered. Uh, I mean, I followed the most of the discussions, even if when I was not present uh, on the screen, I was listening. Uh, on my phone, wherever I was, and uh, I was impressed by the convergency of our opinions. Uh, I noticed few uh, disagreements, but uh, quite marginal and on the details. But uh, when put together all interventions, they very much converged to um, the same uh, possible conclusions. And this is impressive, mainly since we had uh, in presence we had in the debate, people coming from various uh, countries, from various continents, uh, with various backgrounds, with uh, various personal experiences. So uh, this is indeed uh, very indicative on the fact that perhaps we can understand uh, the realities, we can define the realities, we can uh, establish the right diagnosis, we can formulate the right questions, and we can even give the right answers to the right questions. The problem is somewhere where the political, uh, say, wish, uh, the political will, the political inclinations, and perhaps the political uh, traditions are uh, leading things in the wrong direction. Uh, I think that uh, one major one major problem I have identified while listening uh, the uh, the, um, the debates uh, uh, said that uh, it, uh, consists in that uh, in the uh, militarization, ideologization, and unilateralizations of the international relations. This is one major problem of today. And uh, I believe that this problem uh, has its roots in the fact that we are living in a time when some powers are fading, some powers are uh, obsolete or uh, tired, uh, or uh, um, they have reached their uh, historical limits, while others are raising. And when a new power, a new actor is showing up, uh, the old actors are very unhappy. And when an old actor should uh, cease uh, claiming uh, some uh, rights and privileges uh, linked to its uh, former leadership, again, we have uh, some, uh, some problems. So I would end uh, by uh, you know, calling, and this was inspired by the last uh, session very much, uh, by uh, calling a, a formula, which we are hearing again and again these days, the international relations based on rules. And I think that uh, this formula, international relations based on rules, is something else than the international law. Because the international law, as we know it, is the result of an international consensus. While the international order based on rules it's some of, uh, of, come of unilateral decision. It's an expression of unilateralism. The rules are not established consensually, but they are established by some states which still believe that they can impose their rules and their visions on the whole world. And there we have indeed uh, a problem. How can we uh, go back to the international role? 
And uh, this is my last remark, uh, concluding remark, if I could call it like that. Uh, well, the international law, as we know it, was uh, by the biggest part of it created during the Cold War. Uh, the, the Cold War. So it reflected uh, the mm, bipolarism of the international order. It reflected some realities. It was, to my mind, uh, a very well thought international law, but to a certain extent, it is obsolete. So what we have to do is not to replace an obsolete international law by a unilateral set of rules established by those who still believe that they can impose their vision on the whole world, but we have to go back to the multilateralism, to the uh, broad debate of all actors or all re relevant and willing uh, to act actors in, uh, in the world and try to establish a consensual uh, rule set of rules in uh, which would allow us to live uh, peacefully together in security and uh, and stability. Uh, so, more or less, this is uh, something which uh, was inspired. Some ideas inspired to me by by listening the most of the debates of the intervention. And indeed, uh, even if to a certain point, uh, Mr. Mureshan, I was afraid that somebody. Would, uh, would say that uh, you have breached the, the International Convention Against Torture by uh, keeping us, uh, you know, to, to stay for 10 long hours and listen to so uh, very deep debates, uh, enriching, full of information. But, uh, well, th the quality of the intervention would excuse you and uh, certainly uh, you could, uh, you could uh, defend yourself by uh, making uh, reference to these uh, to these uh, contributions, which were indeed uh, enriching, and I congratulate you and uh, Mr. Cava Maria for uh, this uh, excellent uh, idea and excellent achievement. Thank you very much, and all the best to all uh, panelists and contributors. It was a contribution of all the speakers, and uh, regarding the torture, you have seen we have avoided to have. Uh, uh, breaks because uh, then uh, we could be uh, accused about the waterboarding, drinking water during the breaks. So it's not, it was not, it was just pure torture uh, about ideas and without uh, food for thought, uh, just food for thought, not food and uh, food security and so on, maybe in the future. So Carlos, if you want to say oh, something, one minute, something. Yeah. yeah. Uh, please, uh, please, uh, please, okay. okay. I was in contact with the uh, Yes, Carlos, please. Okay. Me or uh, other people? No, I, it was uh, you, uh, 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 then, then Ambassador Tsar. Please. Okay. Yeah. No. Yes, yeah, Mr. Flavius, I should continue or uh, other people? No, uh, please, uh, uh, Your Excellency, please, please. Uh, yeah, you have the floor, and after that, General yeah. Carlos Branco, if you have uh, something yeah. to add. Okay, and thank you very much again. I would uh, like to emphasize the very close uh, cooperation and uh, fruitful uh, uh, working with Mr. Flavius to preparing such as conferency. Uh, that uh, has some important improvement uh, comparing with the last session that's mean more participants from more countries, especially from Iran and IPIS. Uh, of course, the simultaneity with the Romanian National Day is very important. And of course, the variety of uh, subject and discussion. Uh, of course, the, it was a variety and rich subject. I uh, wouldn't like to mention again, but only I would uh, mention the three, four uh, point. First, the importance of increasing cooperation uh, in delicate crises like uh, Afghanistan. The second, uh, the importance of deepening cognition and knowledge I think is uh, very important. Uh, the third is 
EU political and economic autonomy mainly depend on energy and the MENA region is very, uh, let's say, effective uh, region and uh, the country in the region uh, that has the possibility to make uh, diversified uh, resources and uh, especially gas and petrol from Iran. Of course, uh, uh, another uh, point is it is very important to have significant a voice from another EU country, not only from EU3. And regarding the JCPOA, I think it is very important to repeat that in 15 inspection report of the governor of uh, Energy Atomic Agency, always uh, they uh, demonstrate and the report uh, all Iranian uh, commitment to the agreement and JCPOA, I think it is very important. And finally, uh, I would like a, a short mention regarding the approach of the new government of Iran, who uh, declared the priority of foreign policy, first close relation with the neighbors, regional balance and stability. And I think it is here very important for uh, relation with European um, country that's expanding bilateral relation with all countries around the world. Uh, again, I would like to express my thanks to all participants, the organizer, and uh, because uh, we are living in the pandemic, Era, I would express the best wishes of, of your health and success in your personal and familial life. Thank you again. Thank you so much. So uh, other participants who have to want to say one minute, something? You yes, leave you. I can say uh, something. First of all, uh, may I? Yes, please. Yes, uh, let me tell you, I, I am really impressed with uh, this uh, seminar. It's the first time I participate. Uh, and uh, what really impressed me? Uh, impressed me the wide variety of participants, the wide variety of perspectives, the wide variety of explanations for the events and perspectives. This is the kind of uh, debates we really need. Just to go uh, beyond certain uh, narratives which are repeated ad nauseum. And uh, in this uh, conference, uh, it was, uh, let me tell you, it was really refreshing, really refreshing. We have the opportunity to listen a couple of things we are not used to. And uh, I, I could elaborate uh, on many issues. Uh, I know that we are running short of time, but I just would like to tell you this. I completely join the intervention of Mr. Adrian Severin. I could uh, repeat uh, fully his intervention and its approach, uh, I'm really in line with him. The world needs multilateralism, multilateralism and multilateralism. And if we go in other directions, uh, we as a, a humanity are doomed to fail. Thank you so much for this opportunity, I'll leave you. Thank you so much, okay. Uh... In uh, this very moment, uh, uh, I think we have to, to close uh, the session. I just want to mention something I discovered recently uh, on YouTube. You can find an interview with uh, Professor John Mersheimer. Professor Mer US, Professor Mersheimer, he was our guest uh, four years before. We had conferences, we had discussions. Uh, uh, in in, uh, in special events we organized uh, exchange of ideas also with discussion with the students. So John uh, Mersheimer uh, 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 has an interview on YouTube about America, China, and the tragedy of great power politics. And you will wonder how uh, many interesting uh, ideas you can find about this perception from this part of other part of the Atlantic about the international situation 
security environment, how complicated it is, how challenging it is, and how we have to try by dialogue to, to work together and to fight to bring again to the reality, to the surface, the two uh, uh, words, trust and, uh, and, and truth. Without trust and truth, we cannot work in the future. We need to exchange ideas. And maybe this was a, a little bit challenging, long, but it was a proof that uh, we need we need this exchange of ideas. And we are confident that uh, uh, sooner or later we will move again, we will meet again, and we will work again to interesting scientific papers, books, and important events. Uh, together with, uh, with, with Plavius, we wish you all the best health for you and your families, and to, to hope, and we hope to uh, see you soon. Yeah, Plavius. Yeah. Just one uh, short uh, conclusion. Uh, I would like also to thank you hardly. I would like to thank you all, even though panelists and even though the attendee, all of us contribute to the success of this event. Yes. And uh, yes. the conclusion was very well drawn by uh, Professor Severin, uh, by Dr. Pivariu, also, His Excellency uh, Egbali Zark and also the thoughts uh, from our General uh, Carlos Branco. I would like to thank also again our co-organizer, Eurodefense Romania, represented here by Professor Liviu Mureșan, and co-partner and our partner from Iran, uh, uh, the strong partner from Iran, IPIS, uh, the Institute for Political and International Study belongs from the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of uh, the Islamic Republic of Iran. And of course, a huge special support offered by the Embassy of the Islamic Republic of Iran to Romania, especially offered by His Excellency Dr. Sayed Hossein Sadat Meidani. Uh, all these uh, uh, partners and supporters, organizers contribute to the to this event, a long marathon event. And uh, of course, uh, we benefit for the first time uh, the presence of His Excellency Dr. Mohamed Hassan Sheikh Al Islami, the new president of the Institute for, for Political and International Study and Deputy Minister of Foreign Affairs, to have him to open our uh, webinar. Related to the next conference, as uh, I mentioned at the beginning, we reflect in order to have the next event physically in July, at the beginning of July 2022. Uh, based on these two years experience, I think this digitalization and webinar and online event maybe uh, learn uh, us a lot in order to have a new one as a physical event. And related to the, our next events will be a series of events related to the launching. Also, again, I will mention our uh, book, The Geopolitics of Iran, that here we have also present uh, here another co-editor, General Carlos Branco. And one of the contributors here is uh, Professor Kehan Barzigar, who contributed a lot to the success of this book. So this will be a next of our events. Don't forget to mention the other ones. No, no, Abu I mentioned it. I also mentioned at the beginning, if you would like to be very correctly, the other co-editor is Professor Francisco Leandro from Macao. And among other contributors was present here, Professor Davut Kiani and Professor Ejebed Rosa. So with all these things, I wish you, I think, a uh, 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 good evening, uh, have a great evening and uh, successful. And for the others, uh, we are approaching to the Christmas, Happy New Year, uh, Happy New Year and uh, uh, winter uh, uh, time. So uh, we wish you all the best and Happy New Year. Thank you very much. <laughs>